Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Gordai, your host for this weekly live program. It's a pleasure to be with you again. My guest this evening is David Mills. He is the senior editor of Touchstone Magazine, a former Episcopalian. He'll uh, talk with you in a little bit about his journey of faith. Our theme for tonight uh, comes came out of some articles that I had uh, read of his in which he described his journey, described some things he was discovering in his journey in comparison to where he had come from, to where he is now, uh, by God's grace. And uh, the idea of minimalism uh, rose to the top. The idea that, uh, which you might call a modern theological disease that in fact a lot of people don't even know they have. This, this reducing that which we must believe down to the comfortable minimum. Uh, and of course, like I said, a lot of people don't even know they got the disease. And for many of us, it's becoming aware of the fact that because we've reduced the authority to determine what is true down to this minimum, that we end up with a very truncated uh, idea of what it means to be a Christian. You know, a very famous uh, scripture text that Jesus that gives our uh, gives us what Christ's final instructions were to his apostles. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And that word all is very important. Not just teaching what you want or what you're comfortable with or uh, what you can, you can say without getting in trouble. It's all. And that's a bit what we'll talk about tonight. So thank you for joining us tonight. And remember, you're an important part of this program. So if you have any questions for David Mills, you can call us at 1-800-221-9460. Or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. David, welcome yes. to the Journey Home. Thank you for having me. Good to have you here. The last time we were together, we were with our boys on a, on a retreat. At some, uh, what was it, some some train museum out in Pennsylvania, in Scranton, yeah. and you and I got a chance to to ride in an old train, and that's when actually you first shared with me your journey of faith. So well, I think that's right. That's right. That's right. And so I've been looking forward to having you here, so we can share it with the audience. I want to share with them, as we always begin every week, uh, that initial part of your spiritual journey. Yeah. Well, I remember the first thing I remember in my religious life was. Um, like seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that. My, we didn't go to church, and suddenly one day, one Sunday afternoon, I think, there was a preacher in the house, a minister. And I think my parents had, like many people, decided they were going to have children, what are they going to do? They, they grew up in the church, whether so, so he came by, and he started going to church. But, but for me, there was always, there was a time before church, and there was church. And it was, you know, so they were equal. I mean, and I never really bought it. It was something my parents were into. Um, I mean, I loved them and cared for them and respected them, but it was, it was their thing, religion. Um, Not much of a discussion at home, other than the time you went, actually. Well, they tried. <laughs> so, but it, it didn't take. So. <laughs> and um, I grew up in New England college town, and like, like most kids, and, um, you know, bright book of types in a New England college town, um, you know, was very full of myself. Yeah. So was, was, uh, it was a young Marxist, we had a Marxist club in high school, and uh, I think I was a member of the only Marxist Boy Scout troop in history. And, uh, <laughs> so, um, and, but I felt... How to put it? I felt, felt this, um, and not very clearly. I mean, said like many smart alecky teenagers, you know, I didn't, you know, I'm still full of myself, but I still felt there was something off. And one of the things that was off is, is me and my friends were enlightened. You know, we knew what was what. We were, we were, to use a term, we were politically correct. We were on the right side of history, all that sort of uh, Marxist jargon. We were right. But, but there was nothing in being right, as we thought then, that affected our lives. And I think I and some of my other friends felt that we were still off. I mean, we wouldn't use the language of sin, but I think we really had a sense of sin. We were still smart alecky, rude, um, conceited. I mean, all this, you know, nearly every, every sort of adolescent sin you can imagine, we committed. So I think we all, uh, and I, at least I did, uh, had a real sense of sin. We wouldn't call it that. It was just something off. And yet we were correct. We were everything you know, our society said we should be. We were smart, bright, bookish. Uh, you know, Earnest, earnest about things, feel uh, politically engaged, concerned with the poor, concerned with the oppressed, and so on. And then I met, came under the influence of a saintly Baptist deacon. He was a quite extraordinary man. 
he really was an extraordinary man, who was really, now I call him, he really was an icon or an image of Christ for me. Mm -hmm. He was, he was tough. I mean, he would, he would really sit you down and talk to you when you needed it, but he was also gentle. And it was a combination that you don't, you, you still really find. I mean, it, and now I realize it was a Christ-like combination. Firm, clear, tough, unbending, unyielding, but gentle, meek, loving, caring, seriously concerned about you and your life and your future. And that was one thing that, that, that this was a man who was politically incorrect. He wasn't enlightened, he wasn't a Marxist, he wasn't, you know, fighting for the oppressed, not sort of thing. But yet, he was a man who was, who was just deeply good. So that really had an extraordinary effect on me. And combined with that was a lot of reading. I read, first read The Lord of the Rings when I was, I think, 12. I, we went off on vacation, my mom bought it for me because it was a long book and it would keep me quiet. <laughs> and, um, and I sat down on a stairs Friday afternoon. Oh, that was a longer movie. <laughs> <laughs> and um, sat down on a, 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 one weekend. I think I started reading on a Friday when we were somewhere, and just basically didn't move from the, the couch until I finished the book in a couple of days, and was I mean just overwhelmed. And again, now I realize part of what attracted me in that, and then things, other things I read later, was a Christian vision. Yeah. Here was a world of, of true heroism, of self-sacrifice, of order, of manliness, of, of there's no mention of God in the story yet. You know, there is, I like to talk about, you were, this was meant to happen, you were guided here, this is so ordered that. Um, that, that there were, I recognize now that there was a providence working in the story, and that's one thing that's attracted me. But there are several points, if you remember the story, where the characters do what, humanly speaking, is absolutely the wrong thing. Pragmatically stupid, ridiculous. They're going to they're, they're ruin everything. And yet, in the plot, it always works out. The, the, the good thing happens, the right thing happens, but it only happens because they did the right thing when it looked like, humanly speaking, the stupid thing. And I got this idea, from the, I, again, looking back, I realized that that was a compelling idea, that the world was so ordered so that justice and righteousness and goodness worked out. Because when you're a Marxist, you have this idea of history, history's going to work things out, but, but to be honest, unless you're very naive, you know, the chances of history actually working out right are fairly small. When you throw any you know, personal guide behind that history. Yes. It's, it's a, you know, it, it, it's like a poker game. You did, it was interesting, you read, you're talking about your early experience with Tolkien. Though you look back and see those Christian images at the time, uh, it's funny the way you described your, your, uh, your wonderful Baptist deacon, almost sounds like you're describing Aslan. And I wonder if you had an, had an interest early influenced by C.S. Lewis at that same time. This image of Christ, Aslan, remember in the Tales of Narnia? You know, actually, I tried to read the Narnia Chronicles when I was about the same age and didn't like them. Didn't like them. I didn't like them until I was a, an adult and started reading them. You just children. described Aslan, this wonderful, yeah. challenging yet, yet kind image of Christ, which had such, such a big effect on young people yeah. in that same sense. Well, they may not That's see the Christian that. images until later. Yeah. Well, I think in my case and others, Tolkien was so powerful. I, I, the, the, the Narnia Chronicles are just, they're a little too obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Aslan equals to this is all very clear. Right. Right. But Tolkien, because he's created such a convincing world, and a world that really is real in the sense that it reflects the real world, God's world, the way God created the world, ordered the world, is much more compelling, partially because it's much more subtle. Um, well, I haven't seen Hobbit's lately, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the reality is a little deeper. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just being hard. Yeah, um, so, yeah, I have these two Did you know he was Christian at the time? No, no. Yeah. In fact, from, you remember in the 60s, everyone thought it was the great 60s novel. Yeah. Right. Um, so now I, did, I had no idea it was Christian, but now I see what compelled me about it was Christian vision. And I kept stumbling across that vision as I read more Graham Greene's Catholic novels, for example, the four or five you know, truly Catholic novels he wrote. Later when I discovered Flannery O'Connor's letters, not his stories so much, but her letters, and the extraordinary wisdom and power of that. Um, and suffering. Yes, all sorts of things. That I was always being compelled by a Christian imagination, a Christian mind, a Christian view of the world, without really knowing it. And everything else was thin. It's like, a, yeah, it's like comparing a good, good Italian thick, heavy red wine to cherry Kool-Aid, the great Kool-Aid. You know, the, the the stuff I was really committed to was the Kool-Aid. You know, the the political correctness and and the idea that that all you had to be saved, really, you just had to know things and to be on the right side of history and all that, was very thin compared to this very rich, deep thing I found in, in all these symbols. But I, I was a very dim child too, so I, I missed a lot of this at the time. <laughs> Yeah. Would you uh, would you call this a conversion at this point, or was this kind of a pre-conversion for you in terms of your faith to Christ? 
Well, those who, spe- uh, those who scream, I mean, they have an experience real godliness in the same and others too. He had a son who became a good friend of mine who really was quite an extraordinary fellow as well. And we're experiencing real, incarnate, visible, you know, touchable godliness. And all these things like the Christian mind and imagination and vision over here really came together in high school. And, and I didn't exactly have a, a, you know, one of those sort of lights goes on, conversion moments, you turn around and fall on knees. But just there's one day that, that the world, I sort of woke up and, oh yeah, right, this is the way things are. <laughs> Um, and it was, it was, in one way, that, that simple. It wasn't that conscious. It was just these two streams just met, and the power was enough to, to make me look in another direction. But I never actually realized until I was looking in the direction that, that I turned, that I diverted. So did you then progress from there accepting your uh, deacon's Baptist faith and the doctrines of that Baptist tradition? Oh, it, it sounds ungrateful, but no. <laughs> um, he really was an extraordinary man, but you know, I... Partly, I think, because of the reading, the other side. Yeah. Um, I, I went to college and um, as a Christian, but it's sort of a generic type. So in a sense, I did accept that. Because, yeah. But partly, I didn't know any better. I had, even in high school, I had Catholic friends, I had Lutheran friends, I had Baptist friends, I had atheist friends, and it all sort of, at least the religious, it was all sort of one, one and the same. And then um, in college, a friend took me to a, an Anglo-Catholic church, and the Episcopal church was a very high Catholic kind mm-hmm. of liturgy. And the procession came in, it was led by, you know, the surfers with the incense pots and a cruiser with a big cross and the choir and, 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 and you know, all robed and singing and the organ was swelling and, and the, the procession was about halfway down the aisle and I thought, this is it, game's over, I'm home. And it wasn't just, it wasn't the sort of smells and bells as they call it, it wasn't exactly the beauty, um, but it was, it was everything the beauty symbolized, you know, the cross going, you know, the, a, a faith that's expected with a cross going on before. You know, honorable Christian soldiers, and the idea of singing, the singing together, the order, the history, and all these things. I said, this is it, this is, this is the expression. So, essentially, I became a, a, like that, an Episcopalian in college. Oh, that we still have the, the excitement, joy, when we see the symbols, right? Because sometimes we, we've seen them so many mm-hmm. times that for many, they become just uh, a quick symbol that we pass on, but what you were seeing was you would, you would come away to the reality of them, and then you saw them, and they just clicked. Mm-hmm. I remember mean, Scott Hahn uh, expressing a, a similar thing when he went to his first Mass, mm-hmm. because of his biblical scholarship, and then he went to his first Mass, and was like, wait, everything he was seeing there was complete fulfillment of everything you see in Scripture. Mm-hmm. And for you, you were seeing that, uh, I don't want to use the word paraded in front of you, but you were seeing it portrayed in yeah. front of you in the truth. Yeah, it was, it was that, that stream of what I'd read, but it was still all sort of things I'd read, and it was all in my mind, suddenly enacted, incarnated. Yeah. So it was quite... So you became an Anglican in college, active yeah. Anglican? Yes, yes. Went to a, a parish, knew where I was going to school. Basically, my advisor happened to be an Episcopalian, so I, I went there. And, um, Tom Howard, you know, he became an old yeah. friend, went to the same parish. Oh, yeah. the Home Program. Oh. The inaugural guest. So I went to the, the um, parish and eventually got active in fiscal affairs and national fiscal affairs and and um, they was seminary that you are teaching you're teaching at a seminary yes I teach um, right I'm sort of an in-house writer and editor for, for an evangelical fiscal seminary and um, um, and uh, teach writing I teach the research students right. I try to teach them how to write all right well we, we chose the topic minimalism and uh, can I ask you this when you look back would you have could you have identified your understanding of the faith as a minimalistic sense? Or uh, how did you compare what you believed as an Anglican with your Baptist friend or other Christians that you saw who maybe believed more or less than what you believed? What, what about this issue of minimalism? Hmm. Well, one thing, when you come from a background of the sort I did in that sort of environment, any Christianity is a lot fuller than what you have. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, Catholics have, have, have sacramental confession, which I think is quite you know, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing experience, it's a wonderful experience. But non-Catholics still have a sense of sin, a sense of confession, a sense of repentance, and they're called to, that, that, that I didn't have as a you know, secular-minded uh, kid in a New England college town. And the difference from, from secular-minded kid, even to Baptist or Methodist, is it's a huge difference. So, in one sense, at that age, just being so overwhelmed with 
with the reality of God and, and everything He's given, He's given me, um, I wouldn't have thought of minimalist because it, it was so much more than I ever had. Okay. So, in a certain sense, from that perspective, minimalism can be relative. Oh yes. To yes. where you came from. Yeah, the Christian has far more than sure. than everyone else has. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was in that stage, or going, uh, at the time you were an Anglican, I was a, actually a Congregationalist. I looked down First John three nine, First John one nine, where it says. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. It cleanses from all the righteousness. Well, that's a whole lot more when you don't have anything. Mm -hmm. So at least you have a verse and a call to, to repent and, and uh, the promise of confession. But yet, that's a whole long ways from from even Anglican idea of confession or the Catholic understanding of confession. Mm -hmm. But so at that time, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have identified where you were with with minimalism. What about you had with that the idea of the rules of our faith? The things that guide us in our faith that we either have to do or don't have to do. Uh, where was that understanding as your life as an Anglican? Hmm. Well, let me say one more thing about oh, minimalism. What I also experienced as an Anglican and faced with various problems, you know, the inter problems of, of what the Bible says. You know, as you grow in faith, I was I read all sorts of things, all sorts of sources, and um, let's take the real controversy we'll issue today. You know, the issue of contraception. You know, when I first read the Catholic position, I thought, this is absolutely insane. This is ridiculous. I mean, I had not, nothing in my mind was prepared to understand this. And yet, I would read, and yet I thought, you know, some really intelligent and godly people believe this. Um, it's got, there's got to be something to it, even if I don't understand it. And then I read more things, and there was some compelling you know, argument to it. So, so, so I began to realize, as an Anglican, that there were lots of things that... I didn't have an answer for, and a lot of real problems to living the Christian faith, and that, that's just one of them. And when, when we, so, and, we, and you know, having gotten married, and then we had our first child, you think, okay, now, having a child, you suddenly, you know, this is wonderful. This is great. Maybe these people who talk about having children are onto something. You know, an existential, emotional, we all can do it. So even to take that one really controversial issue, you know. I knew there was a lot of stuff I didn't understand and I didn't have an answer for. I didn't have a way of working it out. I could read lots and lots of stuff on conversation and good arguments for this side, good arguments for that side. And so the easiest thing to do was just to say, here's the core of the faith, this stuff. You know, the, the dual, you know, Christ is, is fully human and fully divine, the Trinity, the Nicene Creed, blah, blah, blah. That's the core of the faith. And everything else is up to you, you know, your tradition. Um, and that was just the easiest way to deal with, with Problem after problem after problem after problem that I didn't have an answer for. And then, of course, we realize that even within Anglicanism, as it was even within Congregationalism, those that didn't even agree with those core. Right. And the other problem I find, even with my beloved evangelical brethren in Anglican, Anglican is I, also reading a lot, I see that, that where they were today, the average evangelical Anglican, who was a sincere believer who loved the Lord, who took the Bible seriously, who had often sacrificed and suffered for his faith. You know, some guys had these little tiny churches where they were struggling to get by. If they'd only compromised a little bit on the Bible, you know, they'd be pastors of huge churches making pots of money. Yeah. But they wouldn't, because they knew they, you know, they, they loved the Lord and they were going to stand by him. So uh, these guys were, were, were wonderful, godly, serious believers, and yet I could see over time that this party of evangelicals had themselves believed less and less as the culture changed on the headship, on the nature of headship in, in the church. You know, 50 years ago, evangelicals would have said, you know, headship in the church is given to men. This is clearly biblical. Now, most evangelicals say headship is given to men and women. This is clearly biblical. So they, so or I also say the Bible isn't clear. We have both evangelicals believe both things. So we'll put this question aside. You know, now even on questions, the moral question about homosexuality, you have evangelicals who 50 years ago, and this, this is this is clearly unbiblical behavior. Now you have evangelicals saying, we well, you know we have to understand this, that, and the other thing. And, and uh, evangelicals say, well, this is another question which the Bible really isn't clear. We have to have look at both sides, have a lot of diversity. So on that question, as you know, the amount of what's called. Right? So that, and that's why I thought, even when people I really admired and, 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 and had seen their, their serious devotion to the Lord, and yet on issue after issue, evangelicals themselves were believing less and less and, and, and saying more and more issues were, were unclear in the Bible. It's, yeah, it's interesting you, you mentioned that controversial topic of contraception. Well, you know, there's the Anglican in fact back in the 1931 Lambeth Conference that opened the crack in that very issue in yeah. itself. And there you see 
if you've gone back 150 years, they would not have been against that. They, they would have the same teaching as the Catholics. Well, actually, in the, in the case of the Anglicans, in the 19, the Islamic Conference were held every 10 years, right. and the world's Anglican bishops get together. The 1920 Conference was against it. Hmm. And 10 years later, the 1930 Conference was for it. And then I think the next conference said something a little more for it, and after that, it's, it's been a open door. Open door. So again, there you have an issue in which one, one major world denomination has found you know, less and less to believe. Well, I think you, uh, one of the keys that I want to get across in our discussion tonight, which you've done really well, to our audience, is to see that this minimalism, which you can be blind to, mm -hmm. right, exactly. is this creeping, slippery slope that you've described in a number of issues, uh, and is really relative. Like at any one point on that slope, you might not see yourself as a minimalist because you got more than the people on the bottom end of the slope, uh, and you just assume everybody on the other side hasn't hasn't been enlightened yet to where you are. So I mean, you have a way of rationalizing mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and not exactly. seeing it as as a minimalist. It, it, you came from that Marxist background, which was kind of marching in step, don't making waves, you know, the, the politically correct with the movement of the time, which in fact had been the influence to the slippery slope. It's one of them, certainly. On so many of those different issues. Yeah. I think the other thing about minimalism, I'm speaking for myself at least, is I think what I found at least in my, my, my Christian experience is that living the Christian life seriously, or trying to live it seriously, prevents you with all these questions you have to answer. And you can, you can, you can answer them, and so, but you generally find the answer that you think you're led to by reading and by looking at the church tradition and so on is probably one you don't really want to follow. And so there's, there's always a, a great moral temptation to minimalism because it, it becomes a, the rationalization. Well, this is an open issue. Christians disagree. Um, you know, Dr. Jones, who's brilliant and godly, said this. Dr. Smith, who's brilliant and godly, said that. Who am I to argue with either of them? You know, I just have to make my way in the dark. I'll just have to grope along. And of course, when you make your way in the dark, you somehow make your way to who you want to get to. And, uh, so I think the tricky part, personally at least, I found was I was faced with these decisions and some sort of minimalism, some sort of reduction in the faith, some sort of agnosticism about what the Bible really teaches, is always the attractive option. It just makes life a lot easier. Well, then whatever got you to be open with the Catholic Church in the midst of that? Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll not take a break. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. Well, I mean, it really is like, you know, thank God for that. Well, I should back up. What? I as an Anglican experience with what, 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 what Anglicans call Roman fever. Um, in my case, and I think Anglicans, it's like malaria. You know, it comes and goes unexpectedly. It, you know, it really is terrible for a while, and then it goes away, and you think, oh, that's gone. Um, I felt it literally, well, it's like homesickness, too. I mean, I, my wife and I lived for years before I called the seminary, you know, just north of Boston. Um, on, and we were visiting there a couple of years ago and driving down the road in the salt marshes where the was waving in the wind and there was the blue sky and you could see the sea on the other side and the clouds and oh, and we both got this I mean little physical ache right here that we were we were not home we were sort of, you know, living in the Midwest um, we went home and there was a real physical feeling of homesickness and that's what Roman fever feels like and later of course I realized well it is homesickness <laughs> you know you're not home um, but you get this feeling, and it, to me it would, it, it would come upon me when I read Catholic writers, who now I re recognize were Catholic writers, like when I reread The Lord of the Rings, or Flannery Connors Letters, or Graham Lee's Catholic novels, or Bride said, even when Wallace Bride said revisited, and that sort of thing. This vision, there was something about the vision, the life, everything, that, that, that just would, would bring on these, these real feelings, a little physical feeling of, of Roman fever. So that was one of the things, and I kept getting it, and it goes away, and you get it again, it goes away. And over a while, I just, I just stopped reading those sort of things, because I knew it was bad, it would, I knew what it would do to me. So I would, um, I would stop reading them for a while, but, but there was a point at which I kept getting those fevers, and I, I thought of Pharaoh in Egypt. You know, he kept getting chances, and he kept hardening his heart. You know, I thought, you know, God has given you all these signals, I mean, like, literally dozens at that point, all these little bouts of Roman fever, all these feelings of homesickness. There's a point at which you think, all right already, okay? <laughs> you've had your chance. I told you 62 times, or 148 times. You've obviously decided not to do this. And it was really a, partly a feeling that, that you know, I had to, had to fish or cut bait. You know, God wasn't necessarily going to keep sort of time 98 and then finally say, I'll oh, do it now. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know I, couldn't, I couldn't presume upon his goodness that way. So that was, that was part of it. And another part of it was this experience. It was a sort of 
epiphany, really, of um, doing a discussion with, I think, 12 or 13 evangelical scholars um, over the question of, of remarriage after divorce. Um, and these were, these were 12 men, 12 15 men, who were learned. I mean, some of them had doctorates in, 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 in scripture, Bible, from some of the world's elite universities. They were all devout, self-sacrificial, um, you know, serious Christians. They all feel the same view of scripture, mm-hmm. you know, the same way of reading scripture. So here you have people who, who ought, if any group of men in the world should have been able to tell you what scripture said, it was these guys. So we went through several weeks, we read a couple of books together, and four weeks, I think, of, of long meetings, we read several books together. We, um, you know, the subject went back and forth, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of open Bibles, a lot of underlining, a lot of flipping back and forth, you know, real wrestling with the text. And at the end of the discussion, after four weeks of this, I think probably 12 or 15 you know, hours of, of discussion, plus all this reading we'd done, heavily, a real intense study, I think these 12 or 13 men came to 9, 10, or 11 different positions, <laughs> you know. And oddly enough, the most conservative of them on the Bible came to the most liberal position, which I thought was peculiar. But anyway, that was, that was one thing. Okay, here, on a question that really has a lot to do with basic human happiness and how, what God has ordained from the family, for the family, for marriage, these guys could not tell you with any, with any confidence what the Bible said. That was the first point. But the second point that was really the epiphany for me, that when the light really went on, is is when they came to that conclusion, we sort of went around and they said where they stood, and came all these positions, everyone but me thought that was okay. They said, well, you know, the Bible isn't clear, we can read the Bible different ways, we just have to live together in diversity and tension and work out our, you know, work out our disagreements in practical, practical ways and try not to step on each other's toes and respect each other, respect our differences and respect each other's opinions. And I thought, and essentially, it doesn't really matter. The Bible isn't clear. And at that point, I thought, if the Bible's not clear about this, you know, what good is it? How is it actually an authority if these guys can't, A, can't tell you what it says, and B, don't care if they can't tell you what it says? Yeah, and, and that was really an epiphany, because I said these were learned, bright, devout, serious, you know, people, men who love the Lord. And yet, at the end of the day, you might as well, you might as well pull the answer out of the hat. I mean, that, in a sense, you're stuck with which way you're going to face because you can either accept the full trajectory of the minimalism mm-hmm. to where you're on the bottom and basically you can have whatever opinion you want on anything and say, well, you know, it really doesn't say or most scholars agree or disagree. Yeah. And that's another case of the minimalism because a hundred years ago, all these guys' spiritual forefathers, the people they, they still read and loved, would have answered that question like that. Yeah. And if you had 12 men 100 years ago on the table, they'd all said, oh, of course, this is the answer. And that would have been that. You know, 100 years later, their, 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 you know, their ancestors, their their ancestors would say, gosh. Well, I could envision a number of answers from your position. Given all of that, you could have either come down with both feet on any one of those, right? Or you could have come down both feet and rejected them all and said, well, I'm going to be a, you know, whatever. Or you, you moved Catholic. Well, in my case, and I, I can't exactly tell you why except grace, is from the moment I became a Christian, you know, as, you know, as a young man, well, not quite from the moment, but from the moment I really had any idea which end was up, I really wanted to be a Catholic Christian. I wanted to be one who was rooted deeply in history, not just... You know, the whole historic stream to be part of a living body that had, had come from the disciples, a, a body that worshipped liturgically, that understood order, and that also understood the wisdom of an historic liturgy that's put together for a reason. Um, it, the, I always wanted to be a Catholic person. The sacraments always attracted me. You know, even when I saw going to evangelical churches as, as, as a young man, even when they had their very simple Eucharist, there was still something, even though actually when they'd get up and the, the, the deacon who was leading it would say, we thank you for giving us this symbol of your, you know, to remind us that you, you know, even, even at that minimal, there was something attractive about the sacraments, the idea of sacraments themselves. And then you go into to Catholic Church and the whole idea of sacramentals, of holy water, all these things that, that, that showed you that God was really here and acting and working through, through matter, through flesh, through water. And you think all these things together, I always wanted to be a Catholic Christian. So one thing this epiphany did for me is to say, okay, I, 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 thought I was, or claimed to be, with, with somewhat of a bad conscience, a Catholic Christian in the Anglican tradition. It's clear to me, now, then, you know, 
that the Catholic, the, the Anglican tradition is a Protestant church. You know, whatever po- place that God has for them, prov- his providence, whatever charisma it has, it's as an evangelical or a Protestant body. Um, it's not the Catholic church. But well, at that point, there's, you, know, there's, you, can say pro- you can say, admit, okay, I'm in a Protestant church, and say, I'm going to stay here for whatever reasons, or you become a Catholic. And it's, it's you know, the, when the light, when you got the fork in the road, and you've got to move, yeah. you know, you've got to go one place, and I want to be a Catholic. It, we, I suppose, almost suggest earlier said it was grace, but really, when you listen to your story and talk about how God is touching you all, there really is this element of grace. It wasn't really happenstance, it wasn't an really accident. It was, but take a second, we're going to take a break a little bit, but take a second before we take that break to describe the audience, what do you mean by grace? I mean, we're talking about how, why you converted. In a real sense, in your journey, there's a real pointing to what, what is grace that, uh, that, that influenced your journey into the Catholic faith. Hmm. That's, actually, that's an interesting question. Um, sorry you asked it. <laughs> so, um, well, let me try to answer it just from my experience. What I felt was, was um, um, what the poet, uh, what's his name? Francis Thompson. Yeah. You know, called The Hound of Heaven. I mean, I always, you know, they said from, from my you know, small alecky, youthful monstrous days, that there was something wrong with me. And it wasn't, it wasn't solvable by my, my simple act of the will. I could say, okay, I'm going to be nice today, I'm going to be kind today, I'm not going to talk back, I'm not going to be mean to so-and-so. And then you go about 35 seconds, and then, you know, there was something, <laughs> smart out here, rude. Um, I always knew there was something wrong with me, and something wrong with the world. And that, that my nature, in some way, probably it's not a good way, but you know, there was something bent, something, but yet always there was this pushing, this pushing that I wouldn't be accepted. I wouldn't be comfortable with that. I wouldn't accept it. It was, I would live it, mind you, and since comfortable in that sense. But there was always a sense that you're being a hypocrite. You're being a fool. You're being, you know, you know better than this. You know you need to move. You know you need to do something. And that first led me, especially you know, after meeting this extraordinary Baptist deacon, to Christ. And then, but it kept pushing me all the way to the, to, to the church. So and since you know, I talk about this epiphany with this discussion, the new way it really was as if I came to the. I just been sort of set right at the, the fork in the road, and there was someone behind me pushing, and I, I still had the free will. I could, I could still go to the left fork or the right fork. I, I could, you know, stay a Protestant and say, "This is where I'm going to be. It's comfortable. I've got a job, a seminary. You know, I've, I've got things to do, books to write, friends, blah blah." It's a good. You know, I, I could have said that, or I could have become a Catholic. But it was, it really, I think, in that sense, it really was. You know, the, maybe the bulldozer of heaven, the better metaphor. You know, something was pushing me, I had to go. And you know, God, God left. You know, God leaves you freedom to choose, but but I had to go somewhere. And you know, so often even when you read novels, you read mystery stories, and such, all of life is seen as this horizontal. But there's that mm-hmm. vertical element, mm-hmm. right? And when we try and describe it in a novel, let's say it's sometimes hard to bring in the vertical side into a novel, so everything is told in the horizontal. Or the horizontal is used to describe these ways that are nudges as coincidences or, you know, I was lucky or something. What you're referring to is this, this direct, vertical, loving touch of God that undescribably, why you, why me, mm-hmm. yet by His mercy, while we were yet sinners, He he nudges us, and I guess that's what we mean by grace. Is the best way we can describe mm-hmm. it. And the divine life touching us and drawing us towards Him. And I was, I, I was blessed, and I, I think you probably had much of the same experience. Is being in sense so dim and so comfortable that that if it had been one push, one nudge, I said, oh, that's interesting. Things, funny things happen in life. Two nudges. Well, funny things happen twice in life. Three nudges. Funny things happen three times in life. But it was a you know, over years and years of nudging of hints of. You know, this, again, the feeling of Roman fever, this ache to be home, that, and always the sense that there's something wrong with you, that you need to be somewhere. You're running into Catholics who, who could explain things very well, who are just models of Catholic piety. And, and so, and so all these little hints, and, and you, after several hundred pushes, you sort of get the idea that someone's pushing. You know, it's not just coincidence, you're actually being pushed. There's a person behind it. Where were you, Jesus? I've been calling you all these years, and then you find <laughs> out he was there all along. Mm-hmm. And in fact, you recognize his voice and the voice of all those that have been with you all your life, encouraging you. He was there all along. We're going to take a break. Before we take a break, just to uh, let you know, you'll see some information on the screen. David is the author of a book, Knowing the Real Jesus. And it can be purchased 
through with the EWTN religious catalog. So stay with us. We'll be back in just a minute. My guest this evening is David Mills. We've been talking about his journey of faith, and uh, we addressed the issue of minimalism, but uh, I'm glad we kind of got into the issue of grace, too, because, I mean, it's, it's, it's the underlying work of God behind all of our conversions mm -hmm. every week here on the Journey Home Program. But, um, uh, and, and, and grace is there all along, not just when, when you became Catholic, but he's mm -hmm. been guiding us all along, as we know. Grace was guiding that wonderful deacon brother, uh, the friend that brought you into faith. As a Catholic, uh, on the one hand, we would say, okay, as a Catholic, we have, how do we protect against minimalism? We've got the Holy Father, we have magisterium, we've got the tradition of faith, we have scriptures, you know, we should know what we're called to believe, you know, unity in the essentials, welcome diversity in the non essentials. Uh, but can, can Catholics end up minimalist too? No. Um, well, I suppose in a way, it, 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 as we were talking earlier, it, 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 it's like being offered the glass of the rich Italian red wine and saying, can I have a great Kool-Aid? <laughs> you, you don't have to take everything the church offers. Um, either it's teaching, it's you know, devotional practices, it, it's the mass, and it's like, um, so yes, yeah, they, they can be minimalist. In, in, in the sense of simply not not taking up the riches. They can just take a little bit. I think it's harder for Catholics who are at all serious about the faith and, 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 you know, and trusting in, in the church and the church's teaching to be minimalist in the doctrinal sense in, in, the, in the teaching because everything is laid out. If you have a question, you can look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, the documents of Vatican II, the documents of previous councils. Um, you can ask a you know, good pastor or so on. So the answer is, it, so it's harder for a Catholic to get sort of minimal, doctrinal minimalist because it's all laid out there. Mm -hmm. Now, it's easier for Catholic to, um, you can't, it's hard to be a minimalist, but, it, but it's easier to be disobedient. Mm -hmm. you know, it's all laid out there and say, oh, I'm a Catholic, but I just don't buy that. Um, and that is obviously a temptation. And, and even, even a, a recent convert like me, there are times you read something, you say, oh, I don't, I don't think that. I don't think that. It's ridiculous. And it's, it's even now, if we've been Catholic, and my family and I, for um, 20 months or so, uh, we're, I mean, we're babes in the faith, really, but, but I'm still trying to learn to, to begin to see, to, to reshape my mind and turn around to, to begin to see the thing with, with a fully Catholic mind. So I know the temptation to be disobedient. So I, said, I think it's harder for a Catholic to be a minimalist in that sense, but it's a lot easier to be disobedient. Mm -hmm. And especially if our catechesis hasn't been all that hot. Mm -hmm. So the formation is shallow, mm -hmm. and we may not even realize that we are minimalist as Catholics mm -hmm. because we may not know in our own training uh, or bought into things that aren't true and not realize that they're not true. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the, the big problems, and I try to deal with it in my book at least, is when you read some of the doctrines, they do seem dry and boring. I mean, they're just they're very, they're very stark, bare statements. This is true. That's true. This is true. Therefore, so it's, it, it's not really, it, it looks dry, but in a realm it has nothing to do with life. Um, if you don't have, if your mind really isn't formed in your imagination so you grasp the world in a Catholic way, that can then take those bare, dry doctrines and see how they really give life, what sort of life they lead, lead to. So in that sense, it, it, if, you're, if you're poorly catechized and you really don't think with the mind of the church and don't see life, you see life as a secular American, which is a great temptation because secular America is all around us. You know, that's the way the society trains us. You won't see that these, these dry rules, the moral rules, the doctrine, and so on, make any sense. It looks terribly boring unless you have the Catholic mind and you see, oh, this dry statement means this life-giving you know, belief or action. I remember I 
thought something like that when I was first taught the rosary and was reflecting on the Annunciation, let's say, and I, I was trying to well, what am I just to think about, mm -hmm. you know, during this mystery? I, I couldn't think very far. And so I started meditating on all the theology, all the different theological issues that are brought up mm -hmm. in the Annunciation, the reality of God, the reality of angels, and the reality of His mercy and His grace, and all the, the theology of incarnation, and, and it's, it's so deep. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of our Catholicism. It, 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 this minimalism just, just expands uh, because of the depth of the wisdom of the Catholic Church. Yeah, well, well, the example my, that I found is, 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 is devotion to Our Lady. You know, you, I first read the, the definition of the Immaculate Conception and thought, <laughs> that's the point. You know, I mean, it really, I, that was my first reaction. And it's only as my understanding of, of Our Lady and her place in, in, in God's life and who she was and what she did is I've, I've grown in that understanding suddenly this again this fairly dry academic intellectual sort of definition begins really to be a life-giving thing I see I see what it means yeah. but when I first saw it I thought it's God okay. I thought and, you know, I, I believed it because it was, it was in the list of things to be believed but I, I couldn't see the point yeah, for me the, the, the sacred heart of Christ the God Jesus that mm -hmm. theology didn't struck me at first until I realized it struck me how much Christ's heart is breaking because of the disunity mm -hmm. that that we have brought into the faith because of our, our Protestant background. I mean, it, it, what a direct connecting devotion to call the unity because of the breaking of Christ's heart for that disunity. So we've got an email waiting for us. It comes from Keith. You ready for an email? Oh, sure. Okay. It comes from Keith. Says, Hi, Marcus and David. As a former Anglo-Catholic devoted to the traditional prayer book, how have you found worshiping and praying as a Catholic with the vernacular missal, liturgy, the hours, etc.? Then he puts in quotes, this has been a challenge for me in my own conversion process. God bless both of you in your ministry. Thank you, Keith, for the email. How was your transition? Oh, well, another interesting question. What I found, is it's an old Catholic saying, but you know, the Mass is the Mass. You know, that, that the experience of, of receiving Jesus himself in the Mass is really quite, there's nothing like it. And, and I like, you know, I love the, the old Anglican prayer book. The, the, the prayers are both beautifully written and they're powerful prayers. Yeah. And they're deep, they're subtle, they're wise. Um, I, I, you know, and that stuff is wonderful. But yet, the Mass being the Mass, has been such a difference that, that, that a lot of these things just, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be polished, you know, sounds good, but we still think just faded away into the background because now I have the mass. Um, in fact, I'll tell you, you know, a couple of years ago I was at a conference in Oxford and walking around with an Anglican friend, we went to these various chapels and churches and so on, most of which had been Catholic churches before being stolen by the Church of England um, in the 16th century, and they were, they were nice buildings, and some of quite beautiful buildings, and then we walked to Blackfriars, which is the Dominican house in Oxford, and we walked in the front door, went to the chapel in the back, and you walked in the door. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a rect it's a sort of shoebox gate room, very bare, glass at the end, freestanding altar, blonde wood pews, you know, and a tabernacle in the back, and that's about it. I mean, compared to all these Anglican churches, which had statues all over the place and paintings and beautiful, extraordinary stained glass. It was the barest place we saw, and yet as soon as I walked in the door, before I even actually even saw the, the, the chapel, I felt at home. I felt this was a home. Someone is here. Yeah. You know, and this feeling of, of peace and quiet, like walking walking your family home, yeah. you know, after a long trip. And we'd been to six or seven or eight or nine chapels by, and churches by then, but the Dominican house, which was the plainest, fairest, most modernest of the, of the bunch, was just, it was warm. You know, God was there. I think we have a caller. Hello. Let's take our first call. What's your name and where are you from? Hi, my name is Beverly, and I'm calling from Plymouth, Michigan. Hello, Beverly. What's your question for us tonight? Well, my question is about um, Orthodox, the Orthodox Church as it views the Catholic Church in a sort of minimalist way. Um, I am a convert to the Catholic Church in... Like you, Mr. Miller, I thank God for His grace, which touched my heart with a passion for truth. Um, I have a woman whom I'm very fond of, and some of our other friends who have chosen the Orthodox Church. 
church, and I've learned through their journey the little bit that they're willing to share of it, that the Orthodox Church seems to see the Catholic Church as minimalist in many ways, that we've lost our purity and our focus and our high understanding of truth. Did you find a temptation to become Orthodox, and how do you see that issue, and why or did you investigate that direction? Thank you very much for that question. No, it's a good, very good question. I, I, went to an, um, I went to an Orthodox phase, but it didn't last <laughs> a month or two. Um, and for several reasons, I became a Catholic. And, and once the, the, the Orthodox phase passed, it, it, it really did pass. The, I mean, the Orthodox Church is a, is a powerful and extraordinary institution that, that in many church places has undergone extraordinary persecution and survived. And of course, our, our, the Holy Father has a wonderful devotion to, to his Orthodox brethren and wants to, to bring the churches together. But, but the whole ra- reason I became Catholic, you know, many of them, you know, the papacy, uh, you know, the sense, having, having that sense, that source of unity, you know, um, you know, having, being in the Church of Peter, that was a, the Orthodox don't have that. Um, the, 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 the Western or, or Catholic rational reason mind is a different way of thinking than the Orthodox, but it, it, it's, a, I think, a more, at the end of the day, the Western mind can incorporate the Eastern mind, but the Eastern mind can't incorporate the Western mind. I mean, we see things that they don't, and it, it won't go into that because it would be very confusing, too, um, complicated. But there was that, and there were lots of other reasons, but, but, but another thing is, we were talking, Marcus and I were talking earlier, you know, my discovery of the truth of the Catholic teaching on contraception um, was a powerful one, because here was, here was something that was actually, as they say, counterintuitive, you know, countercultural. In fact, when I first heard the teaching, I thought it was insane. I thought it was ridiculous. But once I discovered its truth, um, there was one institution in the world that stood for this truth. And that was a big sign to me that the Catholic Church was who she said she was, because he was standing against the world on something that, that, that cost the Catholic Church a lot. I mean, lots of people have left. A lot of the, the dissent has come from that one issue. Protestant, a lot of Protestants hate the Catholic Church or want themselves to convert, even though they come right to the edge because of that one issue. But here she was standing against the world for something I realized w- w- was profound, not just true, but profoundly true and finally life-changing. But in Orthodoxy, I mean, you, you have, um, you don't have that clarity on this particular issue. If you, if you look at um, Carlos Ware's book, The Orthodox Church, which was a standard work on Orthodoxy in the West, um, I think Penguin or Pelican publishes it. In the first edition in 1963, I think it was, he says, the Orthodox teaching is exactly the same as the Catholic teaching on this issue. And I think the third or fourth edition, which came out two or three years ago, he says, you know, orthodoxy is open to various methods of birth control and so on and so on and so on. So, you know, and that one issue, orthodoxy has moved in 30 years to, to at least partial acceptance, where the Catholic Church has, has, stood, has, stood, um, has stood firm and firm against the world. And so that was just one example of, of one of the issues on which I, I, I said, you know, the, the Orthodox Church is wonderful. I learned a lot from Orthodox writers. I, 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 the magazine I'm one of the editors of has various Orthodox writers and, and, and editors who are wonderful brothers in the faith. But yet, on the, this, this and other issues, you know, Catholicism has got it. And it sounds it sounds arrogant or whatever, but, but Catholicism really really had it. How it's got it. Thank you, David. Let's see if we get one more caller to this. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Yes, hello. Good evening. My name is Kenny Bell from Texas. Hello. What uh, What's your question for us tonight? Well, I just wanted to ask the guest. Um, well, first of all, his testimony has been really encouraging. Similar okay. to mine, I was also a um, philosopher. And when I, I grew up in, well, I went to college in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I, I know what you mean about the okay. burning for Boston. But I'm having that Roman fever right now. I, I grew up Catholic for 21 years. But I really didn't believe in God. And when I became a Christian, I became a Protestant Christian. I've been Protestant for six years, and I guess my question is, how did you do it? Did you did you did you face struggle when you joined the Catholic Church? Were there fears about betraying the purity of gospel and things like that that a lot of Protestants believe? I, I also have a Southern Baptist pastor who's a wonderful man, and he's been teaching me more about Jesus. And I'm just really scared about going back and afraid of um, that Roman fever. What to do about it? And then if I do go back. My second question is, how do you do it to submit some of the teachings that your mind hasn't agreed with yet? Thank you for your question. And I do thank you for that because I know it's a journey that many, many mm-hmm. people are on. For 
it's, 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 it'd be a whole other show to talk about how people can be brought up all the way to the church and never know Christ. But it doesn't just happen in the Catholic Church. It happens in Anglicanism and Lutheranism and Presbyterian. I know that. But, uh, but then they find Christ out there as he did, life-changing conversion. And then now you're feeling that, that Catholic draw back. It's got to be hard for him. I, mean, I, didn't, I wasn't in her shoes, but I know many who were. Because you found Jesus somewhere mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, to take your second question, uh, there are two, two quotations I really like. One is from Chesterton, who became a Catholic, and I think it was either 43 or 44. You know, Chesterton said what he discovered was he didn't discover the Catholic Church had told the truth on this or that matter. He discovered this Catholic Church as a truth-telling thing. And, and that was really my experience, is there were lots of things, there are lots of things I still don't understand. And still, if you left to, to the natural me, the natural man, I'd say, I don't believe it. Um, but I kept discovering time after time that the Catholic Church was right, and right when everyone else is wrong, and right when you would have bet a lot of money that any human institution would be wrong, and yet it was constantly right. So I discovered it's a truth-telling thing, which means after a certain point, if you discover that over and over and over again, it's, it, it's simply a safe bet that it's going to keep telling the truth. And the, the second quotation I like is from John Henry Newman, who's one of my heroes, when he said, doubts, when he became a Catholic, doubts became difficulties. And that, that, I think, has been really my experience, is, is things I would have questioned, I thought about, I still question and think about, but with a different mind. Now they're just things to learn about, to figure out, to understand, to study, whereas before they were barriers. But once again, I discovered that I really had to become a Catholic, the Catholic Church. I was convinced the Catholic Church was who she said she was. Then these things can be become difficult. They're, they're just one of the things, one of the places where I need to grow in the faith, the knowledge of the faith. Um, the first, to answer the first question, um, there's a point at which it was hard for me to, to, to convert because I had beloved colleagues at the seminar I taught. Um, I had uh, leadership positions in various Episcopal, conservative Episcopal organizations. I had people who would be profoundly disappointed and feel betrayed when I converted. But you know, I, really, I really did feel, did think, and, and, and it, then my feeling, I think, I really didn't know that the Catholic Church was who she said to be, that I had to be a Catholic, that it would be sinful for me to stay outside. And, and I simply prepared my, the conversion, you know, thinking that way, as passively as possible. I went to the people that I knew would, would be hurt, or I wrote them and said, here's what I'm planning on doing, here's why. I know some of you won't understand. And some of them didn't. But the interesting thing is, among my friends, among evangelical Anglicans and Anglo-Catholic Anglicans, many of my evangelical friends were the ones who sent the nicest notes and comments. They were the ones who said, I don't agree with you, I think this is the wrong thing to do, but I respect you for it, I'm glad you're, you're, doing, yeah, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Some said, I admire your courage, and so on. So oddly enough, it was the people I thought would be most alienated who were the most sympathetic. Maybe a good way of ending the program is to ask you the question I always ask, but it addresses this woman's question. How has becoming Catholic brought you closer to Christ yourself? I mean, here's this woman found Jesus out there somewhere, is almost maybe nervous, will I still find him if I come back to the church? How has becoming Catholic brought you closer to Christ? Well, one of the big ways is, is, is the practical uh, 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 discipline of confession. Now, as I said all along, you know, I really felt all my life there was something off with me and the world. But it never really, it, it didn't go all that deep, obviously. Uh, the feeling went deep, but that I didn't really do anything about it much. But having become a Catholic and, and, and going to confession and having to do, you know, examine your conscience, examine your life, go and actually say out loud, I've done X, Y, and Z, ask for forgiveness, get a penance and all things, has made the reality of sin much more real. I mean, you know, but, but the thing about it that, that has surprised me that I did not expect, that I kind of expected, but what I didn't expect was I don't feel so bad, I still feel bad about my sins because you know, they're, they're sins, they separate you from God, they, you know, they add up to time in purgatory. But what, what I really discovered is, is my sins separate me from Jesus. And that's what really becomes painful. And that's, that's one of the ways I've deepened in my Catholic life is the understanding that when I sin, you know, I'm turning my back on my friend, on my Savior. And that's become much more powerful to me, much more real. David, thanks for your witness. Boy, thank, you. Boy, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And, uh, we do know the genuineness of that grace has touched your heart in Jesus because we see it in you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. We'll see you again next week. God bless.